Barnaby Jones will return next Thursday night at 10, 9 Central and Mountain on most of these stations. Word Balloon is brought to you by the League of Word Balloon Listeners. Coming February 21st, it's Faye and the Moon, the latest graphic novel from Franco and the Saturn Sisters. Faye, mourning for her missing mother, sits night after night below the moon that her mother loved dearly. One night she discovers she can pluck the moon out of the star-filled sky. Back safe in her house, she holds it close, feeling comfort at last. Then Faye loses the moon and finds that taking it has awakened ancient monsters, rats, dragons, and more, who hunt for it for themselves. Will Faye be able to reclaim the moon, find her own inner strength, and save the world from eternal darkness? Faye and the Moon comes from the minds of Franco, whose works include Tiny Titans, Superman of Smallville, Archimaniacs, Itty Bitty Hellboy, and The Ghost in the Owl, and art from the Saturn Sisters, whose animated works include Sesame Studios' The New Neighbors, Hulu's The Awesomes by Seth Meyers, and PBS's Mira, Selkie from the Sea. Pre-order Faye and the Moon now, available in bookstores and comic shops everywhere, February 21st. This portrait of Jean Grey, the Phoenix, is one of the ones I did for a series of single frame uh, mock-up kind of covers for the Marvelocity book where my concept was it would work like an accordion when you open up the book getting past the initial Captain America cover you would fold it out and you get Iron Man and character after character after character and it allowed me then to do multiple Marvel character portraits uh, Phoenix being one of the most primary Marvel concepts because her storyline back in 1980, the invention of that character, that maturation of Jean Grey into the Phoenix was one of the best storylines in the history of comics and stands out as one of the most important female superheroes. Welcome back, everybody. Time again for Word Balloon, the comic book conversation show. John Suntress here. Happy to welcome back novelist, filmmaker, and comic book maker, S. Craig Zoller. Zoller, good to see you, man. How you been? Good. Uh, thanks for having me. Thanks for having me back. I um, I during uh, the interim since my last appearance, I've 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 learned how to get the uh, the uh, video component going. So slow going. I had a friend walk me through it. So. The other time it was audio only, and now you can uh, and now you can see my my Jack Kirby shirt. I love it, man, and I love the fact that we're both uh, darkness envelops us, and I think oh, yes. in, very in, appropriate. In, in, in. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, seriously, last time we talked, it was all about this graphic novel, your first Forbidden Surgeries of the Hideous Doctor Divinus, and uh, man, you have upped your game with the brand new book, Organisms from an Ancient Cosmos. And, uh, well, you do it all, man. You wrote it, you, you illustrated it, you even lettered it. Uh, great job. And I want to, I'm Thank going to you. read from the back cover to uh, give everyone a description of the book. An alien spacecraft the size of a city materializes over the Pacific Ocean and the nations of the world, jointly engage this enigmatic and incommunicative visitor with force. This battle results in large-scale destruction on both sides. It doesn't answer any of the questions that will haunt humanity. What are these ultimately inhuman uh, creatures? Where do they come from? Why did they choose to visit our planet? And most importantly, are more forces on the way? And we get to know uh, Carlton Land, uh, the biologist Amy O'Donnell, and uh, the chief scientist from the Air Force, Kenneth Yamakazi, or Yamazaki, excuse me. Uh, this is a very epic uh, space opera that uh, has alien invasion uh, here on Earth problems, but we also get to go to space. And uh, damn, man, close to 200 pages in story. Well done. Thank you very much. Uh, 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 glad, glad you enjoyed it and, and, and thought that I upped my game. Certainly um, emboldened by uh, the the responses to and, and success with the first comic, I felt more confident 
uh, putting in a significantly larger portion of time. And as it as it worked out, like the day that I had set aside to start uh, writing uh, Organisms from an Ancient Cosmos was actually the day the shutdown began. And I remember wow. I'm a little, you know, like, I, like uh, my, you know, my girlfriend just sort of keeps me apprised in terms of news events and stuff like that. And she called me up and she says, Zala, this is the, the pandemic's getting more serious. You probably want to stock up on some some extra supplies and that was i'm gonna say it was like around march 17th 18th and that was the day i started writing and i wrote it and then i, I worked on another project like briefly in there but i basically wrote it and um and then started drawing it and finished drawing it more than a calendar year later the right around the time i got my first uh vaccine uh so it really kind of spanned that experience and and it was what I was going to do anyways. Like I didn't decide to do this because of because of lockdown. And I live in New York City, and and, and lockdown was taken pretty seriously here. Certainly. Um. And and, and certainly I'm going to you know go with whatever the CDC uh, puts out there. And I uh, it, and so it just lined up. So it, in a way, my life was less affected than most. I mean, my my girlfriend is a massage therapist, and her practice went from being completely wow. booked. To just having to like four months of not seeing another person and 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 paying rent for a space that she couldn't use, so it was much, much tougher on her, for instance, than me because I was just I was planning on going into the cave and just working for what I assumed was going to be something like a calendar year on this project, and wound up being a little bit more than that. You know, I'm sure we covered it in the last interview, but let's remind people if they hadn't seen it, um, why the jump to graphic novels you you are a novelist as well and have released several novels over the years and i've even got some covers ready here uh, and of course a uh, filmmaker but yeah what what interested you into wanting to make comic books so my first interest was illustration and i can remember the first movie that i saw and my parents were still together so i had the oldest i could have possibly been was three years old um and i have i have a pretty good memory um like i have crib memories and stuff wow uh, First movie I ever saw was Peter Pan, and I remember I saw it at the Dadeland Theater in Miami, the Dadeland Twin, which were, these were really like giant screens. I saw RoboCop there for the first time, Die Hard there for the first time, a bunch of you know, Predator there for the first time, a lot of stuff. But Peter Pan was the first movie that I saw, and I was and I was interested from a very young age. I can't say from age two or three, but very early on in animation, and uh, and then I got bit by the comic book bug. Uh, whenever that I. I Spider-Man got a black suit and I knew this was happening and it was different than the cartoons. So I remember there's some issue of that with um, maybe it was like Hobgoblin on the cover. It was like right after he got the black suit. So I got pulled into that. And at the same time, I was going to um, uh, like drugstores and stuff in uh, in Miami. And the Punisher miniseries was out, the one with those beautifully painted Mike Zek covers. And I was really into Conan uh thanks uh neil and uh julie johnson um I, I and i was going and getting a lot of conan stuff so those were my initial like my initial interest was black like black suit spider-man um conan stuff like king conan savage sort of conan conan the barbarian like i was getting them all uh and punisher and uh and then you know batman and judge dread were, were soon to you know be added in, in, into the mix but my interest in illustration never went away and um, uh, I, I, I know I'm going to I'm going to wager I'm in the top 0.1 percentile of like 50 year old dudes in their knowledge of anime, uh, because I've been watching that stuff uh, since it was you, the only way you could watch it were bootleg cassettes that were not translated in the 80s. Oh, yeah. I bought, I bought from some guy named Fernando who would drive them over to my house uh, in, in the 80s. And it would like they were just boots from a. Uh, from laser discs, and it was the only way you could sure. see. It, and I watched them that way. So my interest in like comics and animation was always there. And then when I started, when I got my three picture deal at Warner Brothers, which was for a western script I'd written called The Brigands of Rattleborge, when I got that deal, um, I went out and got a page of Watchmen original art. Wow! And I uh, and then I remember I sold another script of mine to Sony, and I went out and I got original cells from Pinocchio and oh my god that's great say all of my like all of the different points of success in my life 
I can, I can like where I, where I made a, a good chunk of change. I mean, there are obviously successes that aren't financial successes, but the ones that were both creative and financial successes, there's a reward in the room, you know, to, to my left of, you know, of, of, of art that I got. I'll, I'll, uh... Oh, that's great. While, uh, while Zoller's doing that, I'll remind everyone uh, mentioning Watchmen tomorrow morning, 10 a.m. Eastern, Dave Gibbons and I will be talking about his autobiography. And I'm so glad Dave has come back. It's fantastic. And it's out soon. So, oh, my God. All right. Zoller has brought some. Well, this could be more appropriate with what you just said. So here's my here's a page of Watchmen. Um, oh, my God. Great page. Uh, you know, it's got the whole it's got the whole crew up here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> A couple of the yellow, the yellow ones were Xeroxes because those were repeated panels from uh, earlier pages in the book. But uh, I mean, Dave Gibbons is like immaculate perfectionist. It's like there aren't that many guys that precise. And obviously, I mean, there's this. And I think he drew a lot. I, I just got a vault. He drew a lot of Rogue Trooper, right? For Love Rogue Trooper. Absolutely, he did. Yes. So, so for instance, that was a, that was a six. You know, I I'd sold something there, and then here I'd sold something. I'm not going to show all of my art, but I just thought I would share. I'm wearing a Kirby shirt, so I might as well show this commandy page. That's outstanding, man. Jesus. So oh, I love it. So to answer your question, like my interest in illustration, so let's say animation and comic art uh, has always been a top interest. Like I'm a metalhead. I'm really into soul. I'm really into progressive rock. I'm really into movies. I'm really into books, but nothing. I'm going to say there's no interest that's ever exceeded, let's say, comics and animation. And it's something that I'm. I mean, right now I'm trying to push an animated show forward, and I've been trying to do that from the beginning. Uh, and in the case of um, doing a comic, I'm like, well, this is something on a scale that that I can that I can manage. And I, I probably mentioned this uh, when, when last we spoke, but. I started reading a lot more independent stuff and stuff where, let's say the art, is, I mean, I just showed you a Kirby and a Dave Gibbons page. So these people are like craftsmen of the, of the highest order. But I started reading a lot of indie comics and some, um, you know, some of these artists, I looked at their work and I was like, I'm like, ah, it's better than I would be able to do, but not not like not like the way that Dave Gibbons or Brian Bolland or Richard Corbin or Frazetta or any of these people where they're just like light years beyond what I can do. And uh, and I've also just over time just grown to appreciate more and more uh, the cartoonist, the writer artist who just does it all himself or herself and just just puts it out there. And um, yeah, and I, and I knew I wanted to become a better illustrator. And if I just wrote a comic and gave it to an artist, Certainly, there are many, 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 many artists who are far more skilled than I am technically. But that doesn't necessarily mean they would tell the story more cleanly or clearly than I do. And so I had confidence in that because I did. I never studied a comic art like this is all just I'm looking at comics and, you know, I'm watching um, cartoonist kayfabe or reading process. I love Jim and uh, Jim and Ed, they're great, man. Have you have you been on their show yet? I've I've not I've not been on their show, but I learned a lot from from those guys and hearing them talk about the craft. That I learned a lot from the the Fantagraphics Don Rosa Donald Duck uh, Uncle Scrooge collections because he put his thumbnails in the back, and that was kind of the first time I really saw thumbnails. So I just saw a way to um, do this. And with the first comic, Forbidden Surgeries of the Hideous Doctor De Venus, I said, okay, like I'm going to spend five six months doing this, and that's it. I'm going to put it out in the world and see if it's clear. And while some people like it and embrace the full thing, some people like it and accept the amateurish art, uh, and some people can't get past the art. For me, it's like I'm telling the story clearly and cleanly. And um, and I knew with my first book I would have a lot of criticisms for the art when I was done, and I do. That's not a surprise. But going into the second one, I had a, I had a, I felt I had just, a, I, I'd come up with a better method. Uh, and learned a lot so that like I knew when I was finished with the first comic, probably like 80 percent of the panels I would have more criticisms than compliments for. And I feel that that statistic has gotten a whole lot better on on the second one, partially because I just I, I, for instance, I learned don't ink the, the page the same day that you pencil it. Ha! Separating those gives you a little gives you some clarity. It's like I don't shoot a scene in a movie and then edit it that day. I'm like you, yeah. you, you get some clarity looking at the performances and I get some clarity coming back to some pencils that I did 
two weeks ago, three weeks ago, I'm like, oh, this this car looks really shitty, or oh, this guy's eyes are uneven, or this woman's posture is really stiff, or whatever it is. Um, so uh, it's a long a long rambling answer, but no. I love comics. I love and I love animation. And I love illustrated art. And I could make all the movies I want in the world and write all the prose books in the world, but none of that's going to make me a better illustrator. And none of that's going to satisfy my desire to tell stories through illustrated art. I get it, man. And honestly, I said this uh, before we went on the air. Uh, I see the improvement in your art since Dr. Davinas. And in fact, I really appreciate it here. I'm going to show uh, a bit of it right here. This is them in space, obviously. Um, but I... Uh, what I what I appreciate about your artsy is the fact that it reminds me of it. Now I'm blanking on his last name, the the indie uh, writer artist that does Berlin, Jason, and I can't remember his last name. But it, it your your art style is very similar to his, and uh, by that I mean, guy, are you talking about the guy Jason? And it's just one oh, name, it's Jason. Yes, Berlin, Jason. Jason. Okay, I see a kinship with your art and Jason's, and that's great because well, okay, it's, it's unique and it's. And it, it's your vision, as you say, and that's great. And it and it it tells the story. It supports the story. So as great as Kirby is at doing cosmic, or Dave Gibbons, as we were talking about, and some of these wonderful, almost realistic kind of, or or more, you know, just traditional, sure. yeah, right? more like traditionally rendered, anatomically perfect, um, like for shortening. Yeah, that that there are people who do that perfectly. Right, but again. I like and appreciate um, people like Jason and yourself that really are, you know, just kind of unique that way and, and, and bring your own independent voices. And that's the thing. I think older readers accept that. And we are, we, we've, we've seen the traditional comic art for decades in some cases, how you doing? Yeah. But, but that's why it's like, if the story's good, we appreciate it. And, and regardless, like I said, I just think you're getting better. And it's that Gladwell theory of, you know, 10,000 hours, and and you'll keep getting better, man. So you know you're on your way. Thanks, and, and um, and that and that's the and that's the the thought because I've spoken with some super talented artists who are much 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 more skilled than I am at rendering anatomy, figure shading, all this all this sort of stuff. But I'm not going to get better if they draw my story. And at this point, if I'm writing if I'm writing a story, like I can, if I can just go all the way and and, and crisp and, and and crisp up the prose and make it sharp and make it a book. Or if I'm designing it to be a movie or a TV show, I can try and push it that way. So for me to do comics, what's the difference? Like for me to just write the story and hand it off to someone, I might do that at some point. I'm not opposed to that, sure. but I, I I do have I do I'm, I'm going to certainly my next graphic novel, and I'm already like getting together ideas for that, and and just kind I do like just sort of loose ideas before the, the writing process, and I'm already doing that for the next one. The next one I will write and draw. Uh, and, and, you know, ink and, and letter and do absolutely everything the same way I did the first, the first two. And then after I've done three, I guess I have this bizarre rule of three, which is like three, it starts to be like a catalog or a repertoire. You make, you make one movie, you have one book, you have one album. You don't really have a sense of the artist and the voice. You have two, then you start to get a sense. I feel you have three and then there's a sense like, I'm you know, yeah. it was why I had a definite, hard push to get through to get the three movies out there you know with momentum and um it's not easy to get to get a movie going and we can discuss that process yeah. uh, later in this interview but it was like once i have three i'm like i think there's a sense of what my voice is as a filmmaker which isn't to say i wouldn't do different things in the future but there's a sense of that and i have um six novels out now and i spent uh 2022 writing a high fantasy novel so that's one I'm, I'm right now I'm right now taking to to, to publishers uh, and you know and looking to get that one out there. But I think once I had like three novels out there, I don't know that novel four or five, even if some of them are different genres, are like oh now we have a sense of this guy. Though if they're very different, maybe they they show you that um, the artist's interests uh, and talents are a little bit beyond uh, you know whatever it originally is. I mean certainly. Or I have a huge interest in science fiction, especially hard science fiction, and that isn't necessarily evident from um, the three movies I have out there. Certainly, absolutely not. No, and in fact, uh, Doctor Davinus, kind of a turn of this Victorian almost, or, yeah. or is it early, like you know early nineteen hundreds? That's, that's right. 
okay, so that's a horror story. This is a modern combination of big ideas in space. Uh, you know, think of uh, you know Kubrick, but also think of Independence Day, kind of a mashup in some ways. I would say science fiction was in terms of genre. The next mm -hmm. graphic novel without you don't even have to tell me what the genre is. Are you going to do a different genre for the third graphic novel? I want to do science fiction. I really like okay. this medium. I really like this medium for science fiction. Great. And some of it is because, um, at like directing, like directing a movie. If you're doing a giant scale science fiction thing, first off, the budgets are beyond what I could realistically get and control with Final Cut. No one is giving me 150 million dollars or 200 million dollars in Final yeah. Cut. This and I'm not doing a very expensive movie, no question. And I'm, and I'm not doing a movie unless, unless. It's, plus, um, <laughs> but I do think certain science fiction tales, like Organisms from an Ancient Cosmos, and the one that I'm thinking of for my next comic, um, uh, there's there is an immediacy with revealing certain things visually that I can put it in prose, and I have a science fiction novel out there, Corpus Chrome Incorporated, which is maybe like my fourth novel published is a sci-fi novel. And I have and I have sci-fi sci scripts. There's one on my site that goes pretty that, that called De Repairs that goes fairly yes. Uh, and and I have and I have a script that like occasionally has actors and directors involved taking it forward. Um, that goes pretty deep with string theory and particle physics. So wow. I have it and all that stuff. It's a, it's just a different it's a different thing. But for me as a director, I know I know the movie uh, the movie I don't want to make is the movie where I'm sitting in post for a year criticizing cg shots um so i'm like i'm i'm good to say the medium that i want to do visual science fiction storytelling or uh, graphic novels i would i could write a script for someone else to make but that process of, of nitpicking cg shots for a year um and again like i see 150 200 million dollar movies where it's like sky's the limit with the budget and, and, and the cg shots still don't look good to me so i'm setting myself up for an unpleasant experience um with 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 that sort of thing so to me comics are a really good medium for me to do the kind of science fiction i want to do so the next one is going to be science fiction after that i'm not quite sure i actually have um i i uh i've actually written some of uh like i wanted like a, a comedy comic strip with like a talk like a funny animal comic strip which will be probably even less expected than more more science fiction <laughs> But um, but that's something I want to explore uh, after I get the third graphic novel out. That sounds great, man. All right, you know uh, people are asking questions, so let me uh, let me get you to answer some of these. George wanted to know: Are there any video games that particularly influenced you? I'm not a big video game person. I am a huge board game player, and I grew up oh. playing Dungeons and Dragons, and I still play um rpgs when i can get the guys uh together i had a good group uh in the in the city where in in like i say like 2000 and maybe five to about 2015 where we really like it was like 10 years where we were really regular with the, with the group but i'm more of a an rpg guy and i've really gotten into the board game hobby whether it's war games or super complicated uh euros like i really like the games designed by Vito lacerda and um uh martin wallace and 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 people like that so video games don't really they haven't really figured in there but when i was a little kid i was certainly very into my atari and then nintendo and occasionally i'll play something on the on the switch fair enough uh max wants to know what the status is of flesh beneath the concrete <laughs> uh, that the stat so flesh beneath the concrete there's no status with with that um that was uh, an idea I had for a horror movie that I pitched to my team uh, right before I wrote Bone Tomahawk. And they said, if you write a Western, we're probably going to be able to, to get a more uh, prestigious cast, like judging from all of the A-list actors and directors who had gone ar around my first Western. And it, it, is like, it is like half of the most famous actors at some point have been were involved with that piece. And I don't know if it will, if it will ever get made. Uh, the Brigands are out of Borge. And so I wrote Bones Um as a as instead of writing Flesh Beneath the Concrete. That idea and that title would probably change because I don't know that I'm doubling up on the concretes in my life. Um, yeah, that idea is still there, and there is a chance I could do it. Um, I'm 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 exploring four other different movie television options right now, but that's sort of in my back pocket of something I can write that I could do cheaply 
if it doesn't all come together with cast and financing and um, creative control, which those are like that's the that's the triangle I, I deal with. And sometimes it's it's easier and quicker, and sometimes it's not. Dex likes the title "Flesh Beneath the Concrete." I, 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 thank you. I like the title. I like the title as well. Um, <laughs> I, it might just change to pavement. <laughs> um, and then building on this, Nick Lackey, and I didn't realize this. Maybe you mentioned this last time we talked. Bone Tomahawk was my, you know, uh, introduction to your work. And uh, Nick wants to know: Did Kurt Russell on the set of Bone Tomahawk? bring any insight from the hateful late on the Western genre, though they're very different Westerns. I know he had scheduling over across. I didn't realize they were made at the same time. I they weren't. They, were they, they, they were made back to back. He, um, and I could say specifically in the script that I wanted him to have a very neat, trim, close beard. And he's a very different character in Bone Tomahawk than he is in Hateful Eight. And, and the reason that beard is as full as it is, is because he was growing it out for Hateful Eight. So it was, he was shot it after. It's obviously bigger when you get to Hateful Eight. Uh, but no, it, it was, he did that movie after. In fact, my, uh, a good, one of my best friends uh, and a roommate during college uh, is uh, Quentin Tarantino's editor. And he was, uh, he was one of the two editors on Bone Tomahawk. His name is Fred Raskin. And he needed to leave my, he needed to leave Bone Tomahawk to go work on Hateful Eight. And then actually he was an editor on the next Guardians of the Galaxy, which also had Kurt Russell. So he had like a trifecta of, of Kurt Russell movies in a row. But the, the order was that I can understand why why you would think that there's there's they were they were right back to back. But it was, you know, and I don't know how long after uh Bone Tomahawk Kurt went to. I think they shot in Colorado um for for, for Hateful Eight, but it was right, it was right after. Okay. Very cool, man. I uh seriously, you I, I, I don't know how you got Kurt for Bone Tomahawk, and maybe you'd want to say that, but I, I always give it up to Kurt. I think he is so the general public forgets how great he is, and then he makes movies like Bone Tomahawk or um oh god damn it, the cop movie, um Dark Blue. Dark Blue, yes. Dark Blue that I always point out sat on a shelf for like two or three years with whatever studio it was, and then they put it out, and everyone's like, Kurt Russell's amazing. And it's like, yeah, no shit, man. Why were you, that, why were you holding it back? First off, kudos to you, because when I spoke to him the first time, I pointed that out as my favorite performance of his, and uh, and, and he appreciated it, and I think his work in that is great. I, I like the control there, and I like the, you know, like, uh, you know, the control that he has in, in, in Bone Tomahawk. And uh, the way we got it was, it was pretty simple. Um, uh, I'd written the script. And as I said, like my other scripts, uh, particularly one called Brigands of Rattleboards, really went around and attracted a lot of top name talent. Um, and like, the, again, like a, like a ton of people were involved, but none of them stayed. It's not really worth getting into who it was, but, but the, you know, like, it had a lot of momentum. And so my name was known in the industry, even though I'd had no movies produced at that point. And um, the first person who was originally in the Arthur O'Dwyer role, this was before Patrick Wilson was in that role. He did a great job. Um, but the first person who was in that role was uh, Peter Sarsgaard. And okay. I went to him and we had a meeting and um, I, 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 and and he said a lot of very kind things about me to his team, and then they felt comfortable giving the script to Kurt Russell, and Kurt Russell read it. And there's a lot of detail on that page, um, so I'm writing. You could tell that I'm a novelist when you read my scripts. There's a lot of detail, and so we just had a talk on the phone, and uh, I, I think the combination of the detail, uh, you know, in the script itself, his affinity for the script. And then also I had a background as a cinematographer. So though I was a first time director, it wasn't like I was going to walk on the set and say, let's shoot everything, this, this, and this, you know, a million cameras. I'm like, I'm like, I'm from a back, I'm like from a background of we're making movies in 18 days and shooting on and shooting on film. So this in some ways, th there were going to be some elements that were easier, obviously harder with the complexity of the piece, but that's how we came on board. It was the quality of the script. And I got this seal of approval from, from Peter uh, Sarsgaard, which I remain grateful for, even though the, the, there were a bunch of versions of this movie that kept collapsing because of financing and scheduling and all of this sort of stuff. So he basically had a scheduling conflict and, at the, and, and Jennifer Carpenter was originally the, um, was, was, was as his wife. 
and she had a scheduling conflict. But at that point, Bone Tomahawk had collapsed a bunch of times. So wow. I had uh, uh, zero grudges. Obviously, I've worked with Jennifer Carpenter twice since then. Um, that that people didn't know how seriously to take this movie or if it was ever going to get made because it was almost getting made for a while. Most of the time, Kurt Russell was always on board, and most of the time, uh, Richard Jenkins was on board. Um, those were the two. Th those were the two constants. That's great, man. And of course, like you said, Patrick Wilson totally came to play as well. Patrick, Patrick Wilson, fa fantastic in it. Matthew Fox. I, I mean, I'm, yeah. I'm a I'm a fan of his work in general. Oh I, yeah, I think he delivered something uh you know quite special in there and then you know richard jenkins was my friend. i'm like i want richard jenkins for this role and he just came on board and the first time i met him we were doing rehearsals for the movie so he was just so um uh taken with the script and and uh that 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 he came on board and and um you know i love the work that all, all these people did for the movie you know from a writing and filmmaking standpoint you remind me of favreau in terms of the steps he took to get to the point where he is now and running star co-running Star Wars, his wonderful work on the Marvel movies and stuff. And it really felt like to me, as I got to know a lot of your work prior to Bone Tom, like when you were writing things like was it Puppet Masters Three and some yeah. of these other projects, that again, as you say, you were used to having to work on films. I mean, you were writing them. I don't know how involved you were in those productions, but you know, classic tales of horror movies that are shot on a you know, 18-day schedule and you know, you got to you got to do what you can in a limited amount of time and limited budget as well. And mm -hmm. that, I, I think it really resulted in, you know, again, the three movies you've made so far and looking forward to whatever's coming next. Cool. Yeah. I mean, I, I it was I had no delusions <laughs> as to how, um, how fast those sets were going to need to move, particularly the first two dragged dragged. There were other obstacles and the complexity of that. Um, and where we were shooting and all, all these other, all these other issues, but, but bone and brawl were really, it like pushed at very, um, accelerated paces with the amount of stuff that we have to do. I mean, there was a day in brawl. We, there was like where, where we did like about like 10 pages of stuff in wow. five different locations. I mean, this is not, you, you, this is not an amount of stuff you should be shooting in it. Like. You shouldn't be shooting that many pages in a day, much less having to go and light every location, but it, it had to happen. And this is one of the reasons that I'm like bonded in blood with my cinematographer, Benji Bakshi, who's great and has been, um, the last couple of years, he's been shooting the new Star Trek show. Oh, and, good one. Uh, but like we were in the trenches together and, and I know as someone who was a cinematographer, it's like, that's sort of like assistant director is super important. If you have a if you have a, a cinematographer, if you have a DP who really polices his time properly, you can make those days. If you have someone who's indulgent and forever um, finagling and adjusting and tweaking, you won't make those days. So I, I like it. A lot of credit goes to him. And and when things got really difficult on, on those shoots, and they did in all all three and in different ways, uh, you know, he was like, you know, my my, my, my you know, like he was in my, my brother in arms, uh, just getting us through of like okay, this is what we need. We're not, we don't have time for this. You know, like we've got one shot, all these horses have to land on their mark. This isn't going to happen. You were, you just, you know, you just have to make decisions because now's the time. But um, I had the, I, I mean, I guess luxury, but some people would just say I was stubborn. Um, there were no cuts or compromises or anything until the cameras are rolling and it's not happening because, you know, ahead of like, well, if you get rid of all these scenes or this scene is redone, I'm like, and like that, at the moment that we're failing, I will relent on on trying to get all of this stuff. And 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 again, like um, if if one were to look at the scripts that I wrote in the movies that I made, I think that they're probably more accurate to those scripts than I'm gonna guess like 98, 99 percent of the movies you see. Like that's one of the ways you can move at this accelerated pace and get that amount of stuff done is to have a plan that everyone believes in and make it. Like these actors came on board fans of this script and then after i made bone tomahawk the second movie comes in and like vince vaughn and don johnson like can't believe they they love bone tomahawk and they couldn't believe the amount of time that i made that movie in um so like by after the first one there's already the trust that i'm going to be able to deliver that in that amount of time and the clarity of vision having written it yourself i would imagine right. in your screenwriting days you know uh, directors were able to abandon and and you know focus on certain things and maybe jettison things that didn't work to their vision or whatever correct 
to my to my discredit, um, uh, I sold a lot of screenplays into I, I, like into. I mean, I have six six on the shelves um, at Warner Brothers alone. I sold a lot of screenplays into uh, into that system. Um, I think I have four different television pilots sitting at FX. I, it's it, the number somewhere around like 23, 24 different pieces wow. I sold or was optioned. Different pieces, lots of pieces. Cool. Really, none. Of, but the, this is none of them were made, and some of it yeah. was because I started to get a reputation of I wouldn't really rewrite myself. And for me, I always felt like the conversation where you tell me how awesome my script is, buy it, and then tell me how to make it awesome is a dishonest conversation. Like, be clear before you buy it and before the money's down what the kind of changes are that you're going to be looking for. And so I had a lot of um, uh, development uh, conversations and meetings that didn't go well. A couple of times I was protected. There were some, there were some producers um, uh, who really were on board with what I wrote, but were aware. It's like, oh, Sony is never, Sony's probably not going to have any of this like child mutilation. You're going to need to pull that back. So, um, so that's that's the that's the kind of thing where uh, if you're partnered with the right producers and they have the right kind of clout, they can fight to keep some of the edge. And in a couple of cases, uh, I was retained. In a couple of cases, uh, I went to the line. I said, this is as far as I'm going to go. Like at this point, we're just making the script worse and I'm out. Because And this is kind of the, the reality of where I was. I always felt I could write something else. I didn't feel like, oh, this is the only one of these I have, or like this is my this is my lottery ticket. I'm like, I'll go write another in this genre. It'll probably be better, um, or at least as good. And I and I and I move on, which isn't to th I put my heart into all of these, but I also know once it goes into the system and a bunch of people are looking at it and trying to figure out how to make it into successful product, um, that's a conversation that's happening, and I'm not in the room. And they're looking at charts and graphs that have nothing to do with my creative process. Would audio ever interest you as far as audio drama? I really, I'm an, I'm a Uber nerd and grew up with old time radio, still love it. And have really been impressed with the attempts at audio drama in the last 10 years. And I think it's only getting better and more sophisticated. Is that it's, a realm you'd be interested in? It's, it's tricky. I am, I'm actually making a deal for one of my books, uh, this book. Slanted gutter. Someone is making. Yeah. Someone is making a. Assuming the deal lands and it's. Oh, we're all. We're just in. Everything's agreed upon. We're just into paperwork. Assuming um, everything goes, this is a company that uses really good actors, really good directors, and does the product you're talking about. Writing something specifically for this, I've got to say no. And 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 the main reason is, and I actually have a piece already out there that is this with 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 known actors performing all this from from a script of mine and um i mean i'm like all the stuff that i do is stuff that i enjoy myself like i, I make comics i've got stacks and stacks i i literally since the shutdown have read a, a number of comics that probably is is two to three times my height if it was piled up like <laughs> <laughs> thousands of pages. I mean, since Dragged Across Concrete, I, I think I've read 8,000 pages of Donald Duck and Scrooge McDuck comics alone. I probably read about 4,000 Judge Dredd, about 3,000 Punisher, like um, probably about 4,000 uh, Chester Gould, Dick Tracy, like lots, oh, and, <laughs> lots, of, lots and lots of stuff. So all the things that I do are things that I enjoy. And for some reason, listening to drama in that way it's something where I find my mind wanders a little bit more. If I'm reading a book okay. and my mind wanders a little bit, I'll just stop. And same with a comic. If I'm watching a movie, it'll continue to go on. But I, for, for whatever reason, I'm just I, I, like, I'm not set up that way. My mind drifts a little bit, though I do love the show. Um, is it called My Favorite Husband? Yes, that's uh, Lucille Ball. Lucille Ball. So, I, I mean, I think uh, like my, my, my favorite <laughs> My two favorite shows of all time are um, I Love Lucy and the Chernobyl miniseries that was on HBO. There's a strange pairing, but I think that the, <laughs> my, the two favorites. And, and I think one of the reasons that I Love Lucy is such a phenomenal show is because all of those scripts worked as audio plays. Before you're getting 
the before you're getting all of the facial expressions of Desi Arnaz and Lucille Ball, and they're great, as is Vivian Vance, um, Fred oh. Lesky, William Frawley, oh. not at the level of those other three performers. <laughs> um, but like, I mean, those other three are are like, you know, are phenomenal. And, and Lucille Ball really is really is the the the, the queen of comedy. I'm a, I'm a huge, huge fan of hers. But those those scripts worked as audio plays. And I've listened, and so that, so I've enjoyed in terms of radio stuff and old time, like I've enjoyed comedy, uh, in particular that show. I think it's great. And then it was, you know, when Des Oppenheimer, I think, worked on that and then went over to the show. Correct. Um, uh, it's like, well, this this shit already worked. Like this, this, it was a hundred percent success without any visuals, and so now they're just adding on top of it. Like well, now, yeah. now you get the now you get the the um, the set pieces and the slapstick, and you can have all the visual gags on top of something that completely worked and was hilarious as audio only. So I think that's one of the reasons why I don't like that, why that was a pillar because it had to run as something that just worked only as audio. And then everything you're doing, everything else you're adding is on top of it. Uh, and then, you know, in that component, um, I mean, she was, you know, she's, she's an absolute master. Um, and, 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 you know, that's great, man. No, you know, and uh, for the audio uh, audio and video audience that may not know, CBS wanted to do my favorite husband on TV with Lucy. And she's like, I want my husband in it. And they're like, yeah. but he's Cuban. Yeah. Well, it, we don't think the audience is going to believe it. And then she's like, but I am married to him. It's real. Right. And, and they, and she really wouldn't take no for an answer. And, and they did end up doing my favorite husband on TV with a different woman and Richard Denning who played the husband, but yeah. And just like you said, Jess Oppenheimer was, was on from the start and also uh, Bob and Madeline, uh, Matt, Matt Bob, and Pew and Bob Carroll, right? And they, they, God, they stayed with Lucy even through the Lucy Show, and here's Lucy and stuff like that. And they really had her Lucy, voice. The Lucy Show has some good stuff. Here's Lucy, less, less so. Yes, but, um, <laughs> I think it, she's a phenomenon. She is, she, uh, she's an absolute un unbelievable talent. Good like, lord, man! The woman was on television nonstop for twenty plus years yeah. in these three different shows. And uh, yeah, and endured. I mean, no, she was great. And I, I agree with you. I think Vivian Vance, vastly underrated. And also, goddamn, Desi Arnaz, both in front of the camera and behind the camera, is a fucking genius. And thank God, in modern time, Lucy Arnaz has really made it known. Hey, you know who created How to Shoot the Modern Sitcom? My dad, Ricky Ricardo. And right. it's like, that's great, man. So no, I'm a... I, I mean... Love there's that and not to go for, cause I could talk about this really forever, <laughs> but, but also, also worth pointing out that the, that the, you know, the, that, that company, the Desi Lu company, you got like, in a way, in a way you can just say they gave us three bet, like the three most important shows in three of the, of, of the most important genres, because we got untouchables from them. We got Star Trek from them and we got, I love Lucy from like, it's, like who? Like who has that? Who has who has those three feathers in their cap? Like you, you the most even... important genre defining show, like shows for three different genres in the history, in like in the history of the medium. Like that's like that's like no one is going to compare to that. And and a small comment also uh, the time element. This Rod Serling play that was made for Desi Lou Playhouse in some ways was kind of the backdoor pilot for the Twilight Zone. Oh, okay. So, yeah, no, I'm with you, man. No, and Desi Luke, good Lord. They produced like all the top shows for like 15 years at least. Yeah. So, on, on, yeah. on the very short list of actors who I would bring, if I could bring that person back from the dead who I'd run a war with, is, is Robert Stack. That I guy, love Robert Stack. Absolutely, man. His voice is great. And, and in one of the, in one of the things like he's doing acting that you wouldn't need to in, in like in whatever that was like 58 that you wouldn't need to change at all in 2023. It's so contained. It's so much subtext. And then um, his, I mean, his charisma is off the charts. His voice is an 11 out of 10. Um, <laughs> and, and you have a good voice and you know, good voices. Robert Stack is, a, is like a, has like a superhumanly great voice. And um, oh. yeah. And, but, but just the, 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 the sort of performances that he does, I could like, that uh, it's it's abs absolutely um just just top tier and doesn't it's not like oh for its time or this or that it's like it's extremely rich underneath all the work that he's doing and i and i heard um um i mean he, he had a good sense of humor about himself and he's in like the airplane movies and doing all that oh, stuff God, yeah he's the he's the he's the uh pilot in the control room striker I, 
<laughs> yeah, but I always I, I, what I heard, and I've not verified this, so I'm repeating this as something that was just told to me was he was comfortable. He was a real card and was like a real joker. And actually, my um, the editor who finished Bone Tomahawk and edited my other two movies, Greg Dorier, worked on what was it? Was it Unsolved Mysteries? That's right. Yep, that was. His and so he and, and so he would see like Robert Stack joking around and stuff. But I think the one thing Robert Stack never joked about, he would just never make fun of Elliot Ness because he he I think he like. It was just too important and like his connection to that guy and what that guy did yeah. in history. It was like, there was like, it was it. Like, here's a guy who's good to joke about everything, but there was one thing just removed where he's like, there's nothing like, there's nothing like that, that, you know, that man was a hero and, and, and went against the times in a different way. And I, a good chunk of my life was portraying this and there isn't something. So I, I heard that, I heard that a time or two. I'm not sure that that's true, but it would make sense that he's just he, like, he wouldn't, he had no interest in making fun of Elliot Ness. The la uh, sorry, everybody, a little tangent. The last couple of seasons of Unsolved Mysteries went from NBC to CBS. And I worked in CBS radio here in Chicago at both the sports station and the rock station. And especially early on in 99 and 2000, they would send press junkets of CBS radio people to interview all the TV people. And a good friend of mine, Frankie Lee, got to interview Stack about Unsolved Mysteries. And and he said even in the half hour he got to spend with him, it was so great, great stories. The guy represented old Hollywood. He's like could not be more affable and just a, a decent guy. And, man, I'm telling you, for old Hollywood buffs, look at Stack's career prior to The Untouchables in Hollywood in uh, movies like uh, Written on the Wind, great uh, cellophane movie that he made with Rock Hudson and um, just a great cast and everything. No, he's he's brilliant. He's fucking brilliant. So Yeah. Oh, no, uh, he reminds me. He's one. I'd, he's one. I'd. Uh, he's one. I'd uh, bring. Uh, I'd bring up. I can Worth see that. Up, Mission, Mission Impossible. Yeah, Peter reminds us that yeah, another Desilu production, of course. Mission Impossible, absolutely make, made the same time as as Star Trek. You know, mentioning Elliot Ness and also the fact that he gave you a pull quote for the new uh, sci-fi book. Uh, you know, Bendis wrote Torso about Elliot Ness, and that's a real story about Elliot Ness against one it's of the early serial killers in in the 30s in in cleveland and that would be i would love to see you guys get together and make a movie of that man torso yeah he i i, I enjoy that comic my uh, what I, what i'll say sort of as a, as a blanket statement is there's a ton of work out there i enjoy i enjoy a lot of bendis and i'm not saying this because he gave me a super nice quote for my thing but like i i, I like a, i like a lot of his work actually a, biz, a, a bizarre thing probably to have as as a favorite but it's like it so overachieved what I thought it should have been. So I read, I read pretty much all of his Ultimate Spider-Man. There might have been some gap in there I didn't read, but the, the when he had, he did, and maybe it was eight issues as opposed to six, but he did a run that was the Clone Saga. Yeah, yeah, and it was fantastic. Like yeah. to me, this is obviously sort of like you know, uh, I mean, me and, and 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 maybe you, but but certainly some people kind of wince. When, when they think of like 90s comics and some of the directions that it went like i could say like in terms of my comic reading like i got into the 80s and then there's the 90s and then you know they like it's it was it yeah. was a lot of what was being made at that time was not stuff for me and it was the time i read the fewest comics of you know between 80s 90s and all, you know the, the, i probably read almost as many comics in the in the 2020s because of how much i've been reading actually more i read more comics in the last three years than i read in the 90s and new, new stuff and and old, but that clone saga, I was like, oh, he's gonna he's gonna tackle this stuff, which is not my favorite Spider-Man stuff, and it's incredible and incredibly emotional. I remember getting choked up reading it. Um, so that was that's really like kind of the power of of his of his writing, especially when he's when he has the room to play with the humor and and pathos and stuff like that. That's probably my my favorite thing of his. But I bring up with with something like with with all stuff that I enjoy, I enjoy it. But in terms of stuff I want to do, I, I want to conceive it. Um, okay. I'm very, like from, from the ground there, because uh, I've been offered some incredibly, um, some incredibly good and appealing projects. And um, unless it was a property and I could do my own completely original take and have final cut, because I was offered a couple of franchise movies that everybody who's watching the show knows. And I'm like, can I write my own original script and will I have final cut? And they're like, no and no. And I said, I'm not interested. Fair so that, that's where I come from. And it's just to say, I do all the best stuff. It's just like, 
I have more ideas than I will ever be able to get that out there in the world. And I want to get as many of my own ideas out there as I can. And and you got to like what you're doing, see, because otherwise it's drudgery. I know that from radio. I mean, and then really that's one of the reasons why I'm pursuing Word Balloon as hard as I am. It's like, no, this is really what I want to do. And I believe in the fact that there's an audio uh, an audience out there, both audio and video, that uh, that are interested in this as well. And I just, I would, re- and it's certainly, I'm 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 older than you as well. And it's like this is where I really want to put my efforts. I really, I spun my wheels in broadcasting, good and bad experiences doing other people's stuff. So, and that's why I have George's question up here. He's sure if there was an ongoing comic that you'd be interested in writing that was created by someone else. And you've already basically answered it. I I, I have, but let me put an asterisk next to that and say, <laughs> um, there are, there are some comics that I would have an interest in doing, but, and this is a huge, but at this point, I don't have an interest in writing a comic if I am not involved with the art now. So let me put, let me point out the, the, the ones I would like judge dread. Um, uh, Batman, Hulk, and mainly Hulk because I've never seen the Hulk that I would want to read, um, which isn't to say there are no good Hulk comics out there because there are. I've just never seen the one that I would write. But so let's say Judge, Judge Dredd, Donald Duck, Batman, uh, in, in, Incredible Hulk. So let's say the, those four. Um, the artists that 2080 uses, I mean, I think the artists that 2080 uses are like the A-plus platinum level. Like, I mean, we look at who came out of there um like that's it's an unbelievable it's an unbelievable thing like writers and artists and so um i look at the artists that they use and then i look at you know i'm saying like i say batman and i look at um who's the guy who's doing um snyder's run a capullo greg capullo yeah yeah Capullo, and um and then um is it is it franco franco via jose franco absolutely wonderful artist so, so like I look at artists like that, and they're like, you know, like light years beyond me in terms of skill. Uh, but at the same time, I believe in what I believe, which is I can deliver panel to panel uh, a, a certain clarity. Uh, and I also, if I'm working the medium, want to draw it. So, um, for those four properties that I that I mentioned, uh, it would be first after I do my third comic, where I write and draw and do the whole thing. And it, I would probably be open to a situation where I pencil it. And then some better inker comes in, like Al Williamson, if he's still alive. Uh, no, he's not. But man, another great man. And not Al Williamson. Uh. That, uh, <laughs> Mike Royer, I'm praying, is still around. Mike Royer, I believe, is still with us. Thank God. Saw a page of Kirby art that he inked. So bring in some terrific inker and make my and and like have him shine up my stuff. I'm okay to that. Like I'm okay to do the collaboration art process. But at this point, to just write the character, I'm not that interested in it. But I say at this point, I will look, I'll probably reassess these things after I've done my third comic, because again, like I want to have the three out there that puts me as the cartoonist who writes and draws, you know, like that's, that's the thing, like, like, for like, obviously one of the most important figures for me in comics growing up and and to this day um, is, hold on a moment. By all means. I love that he uh, mentions Don Rosa because it's like Ed Brubaker's fascination with Jughead. And that's obviously Donald Duck and Don Rosa is uh, is Zoller's thing. So that's fantastic. I love that you're pulling out the art, Craig. This is great. Hang on. Whoa. So, um, so here's a page. This is uh, from Family Matters. This is a Sin City page. Oh, that's uh, great, man. Oh my God. Yeah, Frank. Jesus Christ. So, obviously, he's one of my he's one of my heroes. Like I can say, the book that was the transition of I'm buying comics at the drugstore to I need to make sure. All these comics are reserved, and I have polls at my local comic book store, which is Coral Comics in Miami. Oh, uh, great. <laughs> uh, reading that second issue of Dark Knight Returns, which is the first issue I, I, I saw of it, that was that was the comic that that changed me from a, a person buying them at the drugstore or Walden Books or B. Dalton to a person who got on his bike, went to went to a comic book store and had all and, and had all the polls. And but the thing with Frank Miller is I think of him as a cartoonist, like a writer artist. Absolutely. Some of his best stuff, and I'll, I'll point to Batman Year One, probably my second favorite Batman story of, of all time. Yeah, he wrote it and 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 Mazzucchelli drew it. That's and right. like in, in some ways the art is 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 better. It's certainly the clarity is unbelievable. Like uh and I you know, let's let's say they're you know, they're both 
uh, artists at the top of uh, at They're the They're masters, of absolutely, man. They're masters. Absolutely. So after I have my third comic, I, like I might be a little bit looser, but I still think I'm probably going to want to pencil it or at least do breakdowns, and then have somebody who is, uh, you know, a superior talent who works for uh, whichever company, if it's 2080 or um, Marvel or DC, come in and do it. And I don't know that people would be amenable to that. They maybe just like. Like if you're gonna, you know, like you're gonna take one of our major characters. Also, I have a strange interest in Venom. Um, Interesting. Yeah, that one. And and there aren't. Um, I thought Donny Cates the first arc when he came on and was doing it with Stegman. That first six issues was great. Like that was like, oh wow, this is really shooting beyond the potential I ever thought this character had. And I kind of went and read some of the Rick Remender um, and and like some of the old ones that that uh, Bagley drew sure. uh, and. So that so I actually think there's a lot there's a lot of interesting horror potential and oh, science yeah. potential with with that character. So let's no question. Let's say those are those are ones I'd have interest in after I do my next comic and if and if the company was agreeable insofar as me doing pencils and or breakdowns like some version of that. Um, but again, think you know things 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 could change and if I became really busy and you know just had ideas for those characters. But that's all they're all characters that I I, I find uh, you know I find interesting. I love it, man. I think that's great. Um, did you storyboard your movies so yourself? I went through. Um, the answer is uh, mostly. Uh, Drag across concrete. Uh, I think that was one where I where I did draw. I, but I, I'm sitting down with Benji Bakshi, um, my cinematographer, and we're 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 breaking down the scene and talking about the shots that it should be need, that 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 I should use. And one of the things. Um, that uh, I'll say I'm hitting at the 80% level on on dra uh, on Bone Tomahawk, probably the 95% level on Brawl Cell Block 99, and the 95% level on uh, Drag to Cross Concrete is stylistic consistency. I don't want the style to change for each scene. And so there are rules that kind of govern all of it. Um, and the rules governing the shots in my first two movies are different than the rules that govern the shots in the third. Uh, but having a frame of reference and drawing a pretty crude storyboard for frame of reference for my cinematographer, like we would go through scene by scene. Um, I remember us doing this in Vancouver and there was, there were a lot of great places in the Chinatown there. So we would have all these, all these like pork buns and all this, all this fantastic food and, uh, and just kind of go through and, and just break down uh like break it down and then i you know and i would draw uh and i just draw like the the basic setups for the shots but and that goes back like in the, in my film school days i would when i was working as a cinematographer and and trying to develop that skill i would do that with with people where they 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 brought me on to shoot their movie and i remember one guy saying like dude you could take your storyboards and project it on the finished image and it is the finished image so i was i was a even in the film school days, I was pretty good at um, pre-visualizing and able to then match it. That's um, great, man. That's excellent. Uh, oh, this is interesting. George wants to know, by the way, I'll say right off the bat, I love that you're doing black and white comics, but George wants to know, would you ever do a color comic book? <laughs> yes. Um, it won't be the next one. I've, th I've, thought of, I've thought about that, and some of it is, well, it's twofold. How is it going to be colored? And am I coloring it? So I think if I'm coloring it and I'm coloring it by hand, I might have just added a thousand hours to my like I, sure. I, I, yes. I know that. so I'm I'm a really, really big fan of Simon Simon Hanselman, the the the, the Megan Mog. Do you know those comics? No. Uh like Mega Mega Hex, Meg Mog, and Owl. There it's like I, I mean, I think people kind of call them um stoner comics, but the edge on them is really like it's it, it, they're really um sharp and if you can get offended you will get offended reading those i think they're very funny uh when he brings in pathos i think it's extremely good he's i think he's one of the the like handful of best cartoonists working in comics today wow and i and so my favorite book of his is one called bad gateway which is a little more serious than the the other ones i mean this is like you have a family like not a family you have a group of people and there's a there's a witch with it with um you know, like in, in which costume there's a talking cat, there's a talking owl and they're just ripping on each other. And there's a uh, werewolf Jones is the best. And he just comes in and like, does all like all sorts of mayhem, but there's one, um, 
one that he did that I think is like, I, I think it's all good stuff. There's one that I think he's at master level, which is called Bad Gateway. And he talked about the time that, because he colors everything by hand. It's all like colored pencils or gouache or watercolors or whatever it is. But he's doing it all on the page. And, and it seemed like that was as time consuming as doing everything else. So I don't know, in terms of doing color, at this point, every single thing you're looking at is done on the page. Like even when I had to correct a couple of mistakes that were on there, I drew it on another page, cut it out with an X-Acto blade, took rubber cement, did a paste up onto the board. It, like what you're looking at, it's, other than it being shrunk down from the 11 by 17, it's exactly what my pages look like. So the color question is, that's kind of the bigger question is, am I going to scan them and start to get into the world of doing it on a computer, which I really don't want to do? Or am I going to possibly double the, add another 1200 hours of work coloring it in by hand? And then obviously I'm going to screw up coloring it at some point and then have entire days of my life that are wasted with going back and, and redoing it. So are you, are you selling your original art? Are you selling pages? I am. I am not. A couple people have asked, which I find super, super flattering that that someone would want to look at it that much. Um, I, I'm not, and part of it is because I just don't know in terms of where formats go. Like the um, the the first comic, Forbidden Surgeries of the Hideous Doctor Davinus, Floating World Comics put it out. The uh, guy who runs that company, Jason, super cool guy. I really appreciate him putting it out. Uh, the printing isn't as sharp as I would have hoped. So what I what my concern would be. If at some point I do a reprint in the future and he and I have discussed it, um, you know, like it would be like contingent on this selling out and I have like all the extra material. I mean, both of my comics, there's a fully written prose story that is the comic and there are some differences um, uh, between that prose story and the finished comic. But to answer the question about original art, uh, if it's reprinted and someone said, oh, we're going to need to scan it again, that's my concern. I like I would say we need to scan it again in this new way or whatever. Yeah. So that, that that that's that's where it comes. I've had a couple people ask and it's it's kind and probably the only original art that would go out are 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 pages where I was like, "Oh man, this this shit is this shit sucks." And I threw it aside and I redrew the page. So like I don't, I don't know I don't know how big the market is for my crap pages, but some of the crap pages or crap panels that I discarded might might be available at some point. That's awesome, man. That's hilarious. All right, back to comments. Sorry, a good nerd question from Peter. Uh, Miller and Mazzuccelli team up. Which do you prefer, Daredevil Born Again? Oh, or Born Born? I am so with you. I Z, I am so with you on that. And I love, I love everything that Mazzuccelli does and Frank. And they were amazing on Daredevil. But that that year one was an event, and it really met the expectation when we saw those ads for year one. And there's just there was such a great at the same time brilliant technique from Mazzuccelli, but a rawness to the story too, that I don't know who was, and maybe he was inking himself at Marvel with Daredevil, but it, it there was a difference. And it just, it, it felt like Batman first year and, and even the art reflected a crudeness and, and evoked that early detective stuff uh, of, of, you know, the early Batman stories, I think. So yeah, I'm with you. I, 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 agree, I agree with what you said. And, and one of the things, like, and this is something I talked about at, at length. I did like a uh, an interview that's on the Comic Journal with with uh, Ben Mara, and one of his teachers oh, that's was, great. was was Mazza Kelly. I thought it was Mazza Kelly, like that the C H with an Italian Mazzucchelli? name, Kelly, with a hard K, but I'm not sure. So okay, if someone, I'm not either. If if someone knows in the comments, you can you can. I just thought it was Mazza Kelly. But Please correct us if we're wrong. Yeah, one, one of one of the things one of the things. That, a lesson that I learned, and it's something that gave me kind of more confidence to do what I'm doing, is the simplicity of his drawings and the iconic nature of his drawings. They read quicker. Like some of that, some of that Batman, which isn't again, like those are two of my favorite comic books of all time. Like those are both like Dark Knight is like top three. Like there are like three comics that sort of juggle at the top. Um, but but year one is probably like around 10 on that list. It's they're both all-time Hall of Fame classics. Uh, but one thing that I think is better about the art in uh, in year one, as opposed to Dark Knight, is the, is you just read that much into it. And because it's a little bit simpler, it also gives your imagination a little bit more place to play, as yep. opposed to your eyes are finding all of the details and uncovering it. So there's, you know, there's an you can make an argument for either one of those being better. They're both Hall of Fame classics and all time favorites of mine. 
but that iconic approach. Um, and I mean, the, for the coloring on, on year one is unbelievable. Like the, 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 the subtlety and the muted quality to that. And I think like Dark Knight was obviously great in terms of giving us a new nastier Batman in a new future world and science fiction um, yeah. uh, backdrops and characters going further. And so that was like a redefining, whereas like year one was obviously going back in time and crystallizing the history in a definitive way. Because I've got to say, like, I have read a ton of comics from the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. Like, I've gone back. I've read a lot of Siegel and Schuster Superman. That stuff's pretty good. I've read a fair amount of the early Bob Kane Batman. That stuff's pretty rough. And that isn't something where I feel you go back to the beginning and it's the best and it was all there. Like, I don't think it was all there. I think, obviously, you start getting the mood with, like, Neil Adams and then that, like, Angle Hart yeah. Rockers. And like, so you start getting the mood of a more serious Batman with that, but it's like, to me, there's the, like the defining create, like, like the way Garth Ennis is the defining creator for Punisher for me, without question. Um, Frank Miller's the defining creator uh, for me for Batman without question. Like that, like, cause he pushed it furthest to the edge and then went back to the roots and solidified those and made them cohere and gel in a way like nobody else had done before. I was just talking to the other day about the Rolling Stone article that came out about Dark Knight and Miller was in, you know, being interviewed and they showed art from it. That's what pulled me back into comics. I mean, my high school years, you know, I was I was dating girls, man. I, I couldn't afford it. I didn't want to read comics anymore. I wanted to get into it. And then I read that Rolling Stone article and I'm like, oh, that sounds really intriguing. And like you said, Born Again was coming out right before it. And I read that. And then, I mean, and of course, Watchmen on the heels of all that. So it really sucked me back into comic books, that era of Miller and Mazzuccelli. So I so I absolutely get it. Now, I don't know if you want to answer this, um, because I'd, I I would like you to save it for when you uh, when when if you if you do get the opportunity to do the Hulk. But George was wondering what if you'd want to say what your version of Hulk would be like. And I, it's up to you if you want to answer it. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm fine to say he would be a monster. Um, the people around him and that supporting cast would would be crushed and murdered, and he would be a monster that people, <laughs> he would be a monster that people need to control with cattle prods, and he would not be a hero, and he would not say me Hulk smash. Wow, Any yeah. of that Neanderthal stuff. Like like if you have a Jekyll and Hyde premise, go all the way, and I think that's something that you can say when you look at the incredible, incredible, incredible Punisher run that Garth Ennis had. Is he took that character and the premise that was there. And I've read the first Punisher issue, and I read the original miniseries, and I read that Klaus Jantz and Mike Barrett. Like, I've read a ton of it, and it was never, none of that old stuff was ever quite what I wanted or what I imagined in Punisher, which isn't to say it's bad. I enjoyed. I hear you, man. I enjoyed a fair amount of that stuff, but I don't think I was like, this isn't landing exactly with the level of punishment and nastiness of the skull and guns in your face. And then Garth Ennis does it, and he de and he and he defines that character. So for me, with Hulk, the premise is Jekyll and Hyde. And I've read all the Kirby, you know, the Stanley Kirby Hulks. I've read yeah. lots of different Hulks. And to me, the fact that he goes in a superhero direction, that's not the direction I would go into. Like you can keep the origin and the, the Gamma Bomb, and you know, um, and and he and he, and he helps his, he pushes pushes his friend, you know, into the Rick. crevice. And it, it was it Rick Jones. Rick Jones, absolutely, man. And, and, and all of that sort of stuff. But my ver my version of Hulk would be an, an absolute, like a creature that people need to learn how to handle and then corral into doing things that they want it to do. Uh, and I don't know that it would even be a Marvel continuity. I think my version of the Hulk is not in a superhero universe. I like Dale Ewing's uh, recent run. And, and he leaned, I mean, it was still, you know, you were sympathetic to a degree. But that the Hulk? Yeah. Was it? I don't remember the adjective. What was it? I think it was the Immortal Hulk, right? Yeah, it was the Immortal Hulk. Yeah, I read the, I read the first um, uh, trade of it, like the first six issues. I thought it was. I enjoyed it. I got, uh, but I haven't read most of it to know where okay. it goes. Yeah, it's I, a great I, run. what what I saw is like I like the horror component. I don't know how much they're going to lean into the science fiction Green Door and like the, the Green Door. I'm like, is this going to become sort of like? The green and swamp thing. I didn't know where that was going to go. So my sure. the verdict is out for me. I enjoyed the first one enough that I got the second volume, but I've not yet read it. When you mentioned the Punisher, this is me saying this, everybody. My slight editorial. I was really concerned when uh, the culture wars were at a fever pitch 
with uh, you know a lot of the attitude of oh, sure. uh, bad bad behavior by the police, the fact that they were adopting the skull, and a lot of them were wearing shirts and things like that. And there really was, I mean, God, I remember there was an article I want to say in Time, like you know maybe they ought to retire the Punisher. I'm glad they didn't. I think Jason Aaron is second only to Garth Ennis in terms of modern writers that have taken the Punisher into interesting directions. And uh, I'm glad that, uh, you know, Mar Marvel maybe, maybe, you know, pushed the character down a little bit for a little while, but he's back. And also I agree with you for a man to go through the traumas that Frank Castle did. He's a psychopath, uh, you know, and, yeah, and that's, and, that's you know, and, and, and I might, I might say sociopath um, rather than enough. sociopath. Uh, but, but that that's what that's what I mean that that's that is the tradition of like Mac Bolin books and right. that fish and yes that's, that's what that's the tradition that begat it. So if you don't want to get behind that book, then the book shouldn't like don't right. don't read it. I've yeah, not read, read the, I've not read the Jason Aaron stuff to have an opinion one way or another. I've heard his stuff is good. Um, there's like there are like there are like two. There are only two of the of all the Garth Ennis ones that I've not yet read. So after I read that, I'll probably. Uh, look into the the Jason Aaron stuff, but yeah, I mean, it's just like the the the, the symbol is what you know, what, like like it's it's there, and um, I mean, again, like if you subscribe to that like artistic create, like I, Taxi Driver is one of my favorite movies of all time. It's number number five on my list. Um, you know, someone someone went and shot a president uh, to uh, to impress Jodie Foster and had confused it. I don't think Taxi Driver should not be out there. I think there are people who are unbalanced and have certain views and you're going to respond to certain art, but they're going to be those people, whether that art exists or not. I agree, man. And I, and, and if it isn't that, art, then... go ahead, Zoller. Excuse me. I, yeah. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think the Punisher turned any, I'm, I don't think there was a kid who's like, Oh, now I need to become a vigilante and put on a skull and kill people. But if someone already has those views or, you know, is, is have it like is, is disenfranchised in a certain way and sees it reflected in something, they're, they're going to connect to that, yeah. uh, and, you know, and that makes sense. But I, I understand why Marvel would be concerned. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I don't know if you've read the the, um, the Punisher Soviet, which was like the last, maybe the last of the Garth Ennis ones. Oh, I'm going to have to check that out. Yeah. It, it is It is maybe the best one of any of them. It is also the most frighteningly violent. Like, I, I winced and had a heart. Like, it is, it is off the charts. Nasty, but there's also some profound stuff. There's a there's like a like some profound stuff about like human relationships and in, in long time marriages in there. So there's a lot going on. But again, like if if you already have these dangerous views, I think it's like it, it like here's here's work that's going to appeal to you. But again, I look at Taxi Driver, and yeah. and that and that movie is truly hypnotic. Like I think that that is that that's a it's a it's a masterpiece and has and and I could see how it would have that effect. But I certainly don't think that someone's uh, interest in watching it or or its availability should should reflect it. It's you know there's even that great scene in Dark Knight where there's a sociopath watch or seeing the coverage of Batman. Or actually, he's inspired by some other heinous things and uh, commits a crime. And in those classic uh, television shots of news right. that illustrate the Dark Knight story they attribute it to Batman being back and it had nothing to do with Batman, but, right. they, but the media makes that connection. So, sure. yeah, you know, yeah, I'm with it. It's there. And, and like the other viewpoint is valid. It's just like that, you know, Oh, is this, is this dangerous? Should we not put it out there? I understand that viewpoint. It's just not mine. I feel the same way. Hey, uh good uh, comic book artist himself, Derek Donovan, obviously a fan of yours. Thank so, you very much. Really, really, really. Thank you very much. Yeah. It's, you know, he's, he's great. He's a great, he's a great artist. Um, very cool, man. No, I, I love where the conversation's been going. This is great. Um, so are you, what are you going to do next? Do you, do you, do you, is it going to be a comic? Is it going to be a graphic novel or is it going to be a movie or, uh, I'll, or, give you the or one now. I'll tell you what I did most recently. Um, uh, 2022, I, I spent, uh, it's pretty much the, the calendar year, uh, writing a high fantasy novel. So, uh, it's it is high fantasy, like committed to other. It's, it's another world, um, but I'm not embracing a fair amount of the tropes. Like there are no like like kings and uh, and it's not that sort of like royals experience. And a lot of like I I'm, I'm a big fantasy reader, 
Um, a lot, I think fantasy has gone kind of more and more in this direction of it's sort of become like castle intrigue and castle politics. Uh, yes. and, and for me, um, a lot of the fantasy that I love, Clark Ashton Smith, Robert E. Howard, uh, Tolkien, and um, yeah, M. J M. John Harrison, uh, Lynn Carter, a lot of these people, like a commonality with all of these things is their adventure fiction. And I also believe that about Westerns. Like, I don't think I'm going to write a Western that isn't an adventure. I've never written one that isn't an adventure. I have, you know, scripts out there that haven't been made. Um, and the and the two uh, Western novels that I have out there in Bone Tomahawk, I want it to be an adventure tale. And I want my fantasy to be an adventure as well. I want to move through those different different spaces. So it is, uh, it's high fantasy, it's adventure, lots of weird concepts and creatures. It's not dragons and elves. It's all my own original creations. So I'm looking for a publisher for that. That was um, the style is kind of like the like a little somewhere between Clark Ash and Smith and uh, the Bronte sisters. So let's say not a contemporary style. Uh, and um, so af after I finished that, I've just been taking some time off and pushing television and movie stuff. And you never know what's going to go. I had uh, I thought an incredible cast for the Hug Chicken Penny movie. Uh, and I don't want to say who was in it because I don't want this to shine badly on them that couldn't get made. It was mainly, uh, and I had Jim Henson, the Jim Henson company was on board. They were going to make the titular animatronic uh, puppet. But when we went to finance, people like the Bone Tomahawk, Dragged Across Concrete guy is going to do like a three-hour orphan fable starring a puppet. It was a hard pill for, for people to swallow. But no one believed we could even do Bone Tomahawk for less than $10 million, much less the 1.9 that we did it for. Wow. Um, so, um, like, it's like no one believes in until you until you you prove them wrong. Um, so right now, I have a few different pieces that I'm taking around. Some where I have talent on board, some where I don't, uh, and looking and looking at financing. I would say the most likely next movie for me is something called The Big Stone Grid, which is a crime piece. Um, I would compare it to something like Seven in that it is a horror experience in a crime world. Like it is it is significantly darker and has more horror than um, Dragged Across Concrete by, by way of comparison. You see, and I love that you blend genres like that and you do it in concrete, you do it in bone. Everyone, by the way, uh, Concrete is available right now on HBO Max. So if you have an HBO Max account, it is there. So, uh, you know, if you, if you haven't had the chance to see this, I, I would absolutely recommend doing it and yeah man the way you blend horror and uh and western with bone tomahawk my god it, it's just it, it it's really it, it really is amazing and two Thank friends you. of mine who i trust it with their uh tasted movies and stuff they're like you gotta see this man and uh, and i really went in blind and i'm like wow i like westerns and stuff did not see the horror coming and it was like oh my <laughs> yeah there's an oh my there are a couple of oh my moments in these in these pictures but um which is great. Yeah. So, so I, so that, surprised. yeah, big, big stone grid, um, you know, let's say horror noir, what, whatever you want to call it. That's the most likely one. I have a prohibition yeah. or a gangster piece. That's oh, awesome. going to a lot more elements coming together for me to get it financed because it's a prohibition or a gangster piece and doing something that's period. And at the scale that that piece is at would require more. And then I, um, I have a an, an, a a really great animation company interested in trying to take one of my uh, another piece of mine forward. Uh, we we would think is an animated show, but it's possible that it could be a series, limited or um, uh, a limited series, or it's possible that it, that it could be a movie. But I'm not sure. So those are the most likely candidates, and then there are there are a couple of other things. But I, I would. Uh, were, were I to bet, I think B Big Stone Grid is the most likely next uh, piece for me. I already have a you know a, a major actor uh, interested in being one of the leads, and that's kind of how how the game goes with the with the amount of creative control I require, which is to say I require creative control, like directors, you know, like you know, final cut. Um, I need to back into the financing by by having a, a, a script and talent that finance people believe in enough where they can say he can he can do his he can do his own thing and you back into that or at least I have on, on my other three movies and and then trying to do it for the fourth uh, by just having the right uh, elements attached in terms of actors so I'm already let's say I'm like 
75, 80% of the way there with big stone grid. Uh, and that is that the, you know, that that's, that's the most likely next piece. But um, I always want, you know, like I, I always have my plan and I can't count on actors committing and schedules lining up and financing coming to place. So there's going to be a certain point in the spring where if I'm not in hard prep for my next movie or television series, uh, where I will start writing the third comic, the science fiction thing that I mentioned, uh, and then get into drawing it. And, and that, you know, again, that was my, when I, when I did Organisms from an Ancient Cosmos, I started writing it. I'm like, well, at some point in here, I might need to stop drawing it uh, for, uh, for a movie or television. Sure. But at that time, it was the pandemic shutdown. So the chances of that went, <laughs> especially, I mean, I'm like, um, I mean, I'm fully vaccinated and have all the boosters. I've not gotten COVID. Um, and, uh, I knew for, like initially when production started going back, um, like what started like happening again, uh, like the, the, uh, like the money suck of COVID protocol was going to be huge. Like I'd heard originally, I heard something like 35% of your budget is going to go to this. I now hear that number is much closer to 20 or less. Well, that's and, good. And this, and the stats are getting, you know, that like my, you know, my girlfriend is in, you know, health and wellness. So I, I hear the stats and, and right now they're like in New York, they're better than they've been for over a year in terms of the infection rate. Um, but it's, it's something to take into account, but was certainly something, uh, pr particularly prior to vaccines, like, oh, Ooh, yeah. I, I don't even want, I don't even want to try and do a production with, with that, with that stuff going I on. Had, like, I know I a had, couple of people who passed away. I know oh, wow. one, one with whom I was really close, but like, um, uh, you know, it's, it's like, you know, something, something, something I, I, I take seriously and I don't want, uh, and I, I, I would, I would want to have a safe set. At the same time, I don't want to see 30% of my budget um, disappear into something that you're not seeing on the screen. So my, okay. my guess is that number, I've, I've heard that number is now like 20, 18%, a lot less than it was in terms of that protocol. But you're going to need a different kind of insurance because if your lead actor or someone gets it, like you just got to, you got to be prepared to just shut down production or, or like, you know, maybe you have other scenes you can shoot, but those kinds of scrambles aren't great. I hear you, man. No, I had I I've spoken to many filmmakers and actors that were subjected to the harshest period of lockdown and still trying to make stuff. And that's one of the reasons why I was asking too regarding audio because and and that's not only um, uh, TV and film people, but cartoonists as well. And you yourself making uh, you know the second graphic novel. It was interesting to watch people adjust and not just kind of sit back and rock in the chair. But, you know, use their talents. And all right, if, you know, you you well know Pencils Down happened at several publishers during COVID as well. And it's like, right. all right, well, what can I do with my talents to generate something new while I'm waiting for the world to normalize again? And we're still in some ways kind of subjected to that. So I yeah. think it's great that you made those adjustments. Yeah. And I, and I think, you know, like, again, probably, presumably most of the people who would be on the set would be vaccinated, in which case, like, the risk yeah. is more... You're gonna have a shitty experience as opposed to your life is gonna be imperiled and you might go to the hospital. Not not yeah. many, not many of those, but I, you know, again, like I could think of my greater, you know, like uh, like like friends of friends or people like people I know. Uh, yeah, it's it, it's just all it's shifted now that the vaccine option is there, and you know, most people I know have have, have taken advantage of it. Like pretty much everybody I know in my immediate life. In in the movie business, it seems like the two extremes are still doing well in terms of the Blumhouse small budget movies and then the tentpole movies still being made. And it's the mid budget films that are kind of the endangered species. Yes. Any observations on, on that current status quo? Well, I mean, well, there's no secret, like these studios want to make money. And I, I remember meeting with a, a producer who's produced, I'm going to say his movies, I don't know, three, four billion dollars. So very successful producers produce tons of movies. Everyone who's watching this is seen. And I had a, um, I had like a one million dollar, let's say domestic drama with a kind of weird horror aspect behind it. If you know the, um, if you know the Polanski movie Repulsion, uh, and if you know uh, the the Bergman movie Persona. 
Okay. Um, yes, I've heard. It. I haven't I, seen it, but I've heard of it. Yeah. It kind of. Ha- it was. It's weird. It, it's sort of a drama, and then there's sort of like existential horror, and then also some some stuff where you're not quite sure of what you're watching is the the, the better comparison um, that that more people is just like Lynch, like something um, something like Lost Highway, where you're sure. not exactly uh, where, Lost it's not not quite that that far out, and certainly not as excellent as that. That's one of my favorite movies ever. Me too. Uh, <laughs> but um, I uh, the the hold on, I, I lost my train of thought. The I'll help you if you need it. Help me. Small budget uh, movies. Small versus, budget. Like, Small budget. Okay, I, I lost my train of thought from those. I just started thinking about how awesome Lost Highway was. I get it. Awesome. <laughs> you got to watch it. I get it. So I told this producer who produced like three, four billion dollars worth of the big of ones. Games, yeah. Um, you know, I have this one million dollar movie. Like, you know, and, and he'd read it, and it was, it was, it was good. You know, he liked it, and I said, you know, it's not a big investment to do it, and it's successful. He's like, he's like, but why make a million dollar movie? And why make a $4 million movie that has the upside of like five or 10, you know, and like, it, cause it seems like, like a person might say, oh, wow, a $1 million movie that makes $10 million, that in some ways is much better than a $200 million movie that makes $300 million. Absolutely. Right. Like it seems more impressive, like the Blair right. Witch sort of success or the El Mariachi sort of success or right. the Swingers or all of these sort of things. But for that producer, he's like, it's more work and you're making less money total. So that's the answer, like in, yes. in terms of the philosophy of how they look at it. Like, why make all these 20, 30, 40 million dollar uh, movies um, that have the upside of making 20, 30, 40, 50 million dollars profit? If, if you can just put in 250 million dollars on some Marvel Marvel movie tentpole that has the potential to make um, half a billion dollars, a billion dollars. So that's. You know, and even if it like, even if it sounds better to to a person like you or like me, the idea of a movie that that costs two million dollars making twenty million dollars, like that's a massive success. And and Bone Bone Tomahawk had like a real minimal theatrical release, but it has made its money back many, 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 many times over. And it cost one point nine. Brawl and Sublock ninety nine was profitable before it was released because of our really? pre sales. Yeah. That was profitable before anyone saw it. Before it premiered, it was profitable. And um, and then it's just, you know, however it trickles out. And I would like for both of those movies to have more of a, have had more of a true theatrical push as opposed to the really limited releases that they had. But with Braun Subbach 99, the, the company rele- releasing it, RLJ, like already knew. It's like, okay, like, like this director's critically successful. This is the Vince Vaughn's a famous person. Don Johnson, Jennifer Carpenter, and they they knew how to sell it, and it was profitable before it came out. And and that box and that art, which um, I don't like as much as the other art, is somewhat the result of what like what the market demanded in terms of like if you were going in whatever Walgreens um, or Walmart or wherever, and you saw that image across the room, because like the posters for these movies you'll see are are in a different style. Than that, but that was something that is is more market driven and something that I don't have control over. In any case, um, you're right. The, all the like those mid budget movies, because a lot of the small budget movies have nothing to do with the studio, and then the studio is going to come in at the end and say, "Oh, we'll do this." Blumhouse and horror is its own unique thing. Agreed. Like horror is the genre where you can have a movie with no recognizable faces, some kind of cool concept. Or some slasher mask, and it has the potential to be hugely successful. Yes, like yeah. that has a different thing. Like if there's a comedy, like a hilarious comedy starring a bunch of nobodies. Like I can't remember the last time I've seen anything like this in the theater. I so agree, uh, man. You know, you know. Also, the the scenario you just described in terms of ten million dollar movie making forty million or whatever. Apparently, and I, this is just what I've read and heard in interviews. They did that in the nineties. And like you said, on paper, us laymen would be like, well, that should be a re- recipe for success. But no, you're right. It's uh, The studios are like, no, those are no. you're chasing. Yeah, you're chasing nickels instead of rolling the dice on, you know, real do- hard dollars going for that 500 million or even billion dollar movie and stuff. It's fascinating. I mean, I uh, again, it's why I appreciate being an observer and not actually in the business. Derek, 
And and it's it, it's also one of these things where I can't speak with any authority on the studio system. I live in New York, and my apartment filled with albums and comics and pulps. And um, uh, but it it is and it's something like, and it isn't that the people in Hollywood are stupid. I think the the biggest criticism I'll give the people in Hollywood that I've dealt with are underestimating the public. Um, and that's and so that so it's a lot of kind of patronizing stuff or the you know or the oh people you know. People between the coasts won't understand this or people not admit like, so you get some of that underestimating, but in general, you're dealing with a, a lot of people are making creative decisions and they aren't creatives. And generally what looking at something that and trying to figure out how they get your piece into making it like that thing that was already successful. So if you've done something really unique and different, and I'll definitely say my, my script that got me my three picture deal at Warner brothers, Brigham's a Rattleborg was like, it was like, 10 pages of, of, of weird stuff. And it was like 70 pages of hanging out in this town with no forward momentum with the plot. And then hideous NC-17 level violence. And then writing out and more awful violence. And this was not a... And written with like pros, like I'm a Clark Ashton Smith, uh, like Mervyn Peake fan. Like I broke all the rules and it landed. Um, but that, that movie still hasn't been made and I don't know if it, if it, if it ever will be. Okay. But... Um, a lot of it is just trying to gear things towards the most recent success or or whatever is successful that's most similar to it. Like, how do we push it and make it more like that other thing? Do you, th uh, Derek asks, what is that sweet spot regarding small budgets in terms of... Is, I, can is tell you what, I can tell you what the sweet spot is for me, and it, it's going to be under 10. Um, it's going to be under $10 million because once you start hitting a certain number, and, I'll, and I'm going to say it's 10... It could be eight, uh, but I, I think it's about ten. And drag, dragged across concrete was was like Bon Tomahawk was about one was like one point nine. Rolling Stone Block ninety nine was about four million. That I don't think I will ever completely understand in terms of just behind the scenes on that movie in terms of the deals and 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 things. But let's say it's um, eleven or twelve million dollars, some okay. somewhere in there. Um, that was a movie that needed a different level of theatrical push. And I thought I was going to get it and, and, I, and, I, and I didn't get it. It's, it is, um, it's sold pieces all over the world. I know less about, I can speak. Some of this is just mystery to me. It seems like I should probably know more about this stuff than I do. Um, and uh, I know when I start getting royalties for different pieces, I'm like, okay, people have started making you know, making making their 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 money back, and um and the different deals with different actors and producers involved with different with different pictures. But I'd say the sweet spot, um, uh, for me is gonna be like with with like I just told you, Brawl and Block ninety nine. That's a four million dollar movie. It was profitable before anyone saw it. If it came out and was zero percent on Rotten Tomatoes and was was point one on IMDb and the most hated movie ever it still would have been profitable because wow. they were able to, because at that number that we made it for, they were able to pre-sell it to wherever they pre-sell. I think it was like Amazon, Direct TV, wherever. It's not on Netflix here, though it seems to be storming the gates at, at, at present, like in this calendar year in, in international Netflix. It's like, you know, in, uh, you know, in like Albania and like, or like, sure. like where, where, wherever, like it's come out there and all of a sudden it's on, you know, it's like 20 something countries. It's in their top 10 movies. And this is a movie that came out like four years ago or whatever, five years ago. Um, so I think the sweet spot for me um, would be five because you don't necessarily need to do a theatrical push. And uh, able to attract and uh, the good reviews that I've gotten that's that's going to be that's going to be a uh, a sweet spot. I think you get over ten million dollars, you're going to need to start putting like the studio would need to start putting down a real amount of money in terms of advertising, right? And push that I didn't get on these movies, um, and with the first two, it was because they it wasn't geared towards a theatrical release; it was a limited release in festivals. Like I went all over the world for all three of these movies and had great festival experiences, and then. There are random places like Drag the Cross Concrete did really well in like Arizona and Russia. Can't explain that. It did well in it, like like it seemed to do pretty well in Israel. Like I I can't explain how that goes. Some of it I think is actually just the promoter because I can say with my novels, 
Um, the publisher, there's a publisher called Gallmeister, um, and I and I deal directly with the guy who runs it, and he's published all of my my two westerns and my two crime books. So Slant and Gutter, Mean Business on North Ganton Street, A Congregation of Jackals, and Wraiths of the Broken Land. So those all those pieces have been have been published by this guy in France, and the sales are really good, like comparable to the entire English language sales. And it's because he's a really good publisher. He has a good brand and people continue to buy his stuff. And he's worked up a bit of a following for me in France. France has always kind of just done well by me in general. Um, but uh, but that's to say, like I, I like I know in this case, because I deal directly with this guy, it's like, this guy's a good guy. He's a good publisher. He's a good brand. He puts good artwork on there. And to some extent, he's probably some kind of tastemaker in France. And my books sell well there. Like they sell better there than they do in Germany. They sell pretty well, you know, in Germany, Italy, sort of up and down. Japan, most of them haven't been released. Um, depends on is Spain. Like it depends on depends on the place. But I know, I know when I see the Royal Two Six, I'm like, this guy in France is on the. He's like he's on top of it. So like to say, like Dragged Across Concrete had a more significant theatrical release in Russia than it did in the United States. It's fascinating the foreign markets and how they sell and how they're promoted. And I've spoken to other independent filmmakers about exactly that and literally going to, you know, the, the Eastern European countries or, or even the countries you've mentioned, and, Sure, you know, and again, it's that up and down thing of depending on the country. Very, very interesting. Man. And uh, that's why I appreciate talking to you. See, I really, uh, honestly, uh, this has been great. Uh, we'll remind everybody again that uh, Zoller's uh, book organisms from an ancient cosmos it is out now from Dark Horse. It is a meaty read. It is an epic science fiction story that I think will blow you away and you will appreciate uh, uh, Z's uh, unique art as well. And again, I think we're uh, I, I think we're a more sophisticated audience than uh, a few decades ago. And we can appreciate an unconventional style of art that absolutely still tells the story. So I, 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 I would hope so. And I think um, I. I some of the eagle-eyed people reading it and some comments I've received, like I'm untrained as a comic artist and, and that might be really apparent, but I actually do have some training in animation. And so that was something that gave me an hand-drawn was the kind I was interested in. And, uh, stop motion as well. But that that's a sort of, that's a sort of thing where um, um, some of the panel to panel stuff I feel is, 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 is shows that. And I'm, I'm really, I'm really, proud of the clarity of, of of the piece and the scale of story that i'm telling i agree uh, man so like but again like i'm sure there's someone's like this dude sucks he should hire a real, real artist that's fine but i like as as my tastes have changed over time I, you know, like one of the reasons i did my first comic was i read a comic uh, called wimbledon green by seth and that's one of my other guy yes yeah and, and it's one of my Wimbledon Green by Seth is one of my favorite comics of all time. And it's extremely simple, the drawing style. And when I saw that, I'm like, if the writing is there and the clarity of image and emotional expression is there, it can be a simple drawing. I and um, uh, and so that 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 also, in you know, in, emboldened me, uh, you know, along those lines. And then I also think, like, there's something where I, I, I do read comics where there's sometimes a ton of characters and it's kind of hard to tell them apart. And I'm like, I'm, I'm particularly proud. There's one, well, there's one panel in there. You, you don't need to show it, but there's one panel in there where you see ten different characters, and each drawing is literally the size on my eleven by seventeen of a piece of rice, and they're seen in profile, and you can tell who those characters are. That's great. And man. that, and some of that comes from just that design background. Like, and that would be much harder to do if everyone was completely realistically proportioned. But that, that's a, that's a point of pride that clarity. And that's something that I see with artists who are, again, far more skilled than I am and far better at rendering and much better with cross hatching and, you know, and double lighting and all of that sort of stuff. We're all sometimes confused characters in there. And then I don't think people are going to confuse the characters in the piece. So, no. that, and that's the lesson I take from the master and one of my favorite cartoonists of all time, Chester Gould. Like that is the lesson you take from it. Like you're not confusing any of the, like, like, you know, like, like prune face and and and, and flat. Top. You might compare flat top and flat top junior, um, but uh, <laughs> you're gonna be. You can tell them apart, and that clarity, that that's something that that I'm proud of, and I think that that's something. Actually, the indie style lends itself a little bit more to that 
than the ultra polished, ultra realistic style, which then it starts to come down a little bit more to um, like, what are their, are, are their costumes different or are there, is their hair really different or something like that? So that, that, that's, some, that's something that I'm proud of, but yes, it's, it's different. Like it, it is not, and it is not Brian Boland or, or Bernie Wrightson or right. Richard Corbin or Mike Zeck or any of these, any of these champion, any of these champion artists. It's uh it's but think more indie guys. You said Jason. That that's a fine reference point. I'm and, glad and you Seth, mentioned Seth, and, but I'll, yeah, but also as you say, man, look at early Chester Gould, and I totally see that influence in your work. No, yeah, that's pro he's probably the single biggest. He's I he's probably it. he's probably the, the the single biggest, and he and 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 the whole package because that guy is a phenomenal writer. If that guy never drew anything and, and wrote that script and gave it to somebody else. He would be he would be in comic history. Well, and he and he did. You know, Dick Locher took over the art while Gould was still writing. I didn't then, know that. I've read most of what I've read is like I'm looking at the volumes over there. I think the newest. I don't know that I've. I think I, the the most recent volume I've read, and I've read a lot of years of it, is maybe 1958. So okay. I did. How how is that, how is that stuff that that he wrote and did not draw? I love it. I mean, and it, I mean, and as the 60s and 70s. He got into science fiction. He had the the base on the moon, and Junior's uh, wife came from the moon, and everything. And uh, also the handoff. I could do without Bo Plenty. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I got, I gotta confess. I, I see Bo Plenty comes into the strip. I'm like, oh, I hope this doesn't turn into a whole Bo Plenty art. Oh, you're killing me. Um, <laughs> uh, another another writer that I've had the pleasure of having on a few times here, uh, Max Collins. Max Allen Collins took over the writing from Chet Gould. I know. Yes. So he Locher was still drawing then and stuff. So I think from a visual standpoint, you didn't realize. And I mean, Max loved uh, Chester Gould and really adored him and really did, I think, brought it back down to reality. I think, right. I think, you know, and, and left the moon stuff. I used to love the flying garbage cans that, uh, you know, uh, Sam and, and Dick were riding around in when Chet Gould was kind of, you know, uh, interested and intrigued by science fiction. I know less. Of, I know this isn't the era of, of that stuff that I know, but I'll get there eventually. I mean, I'm, I'm really like, like Judge Dredd at some point. I'm just like, I'm going to get, I'm just like each year I'm reading a few volumes and, and I'm just going to like kind of go through uh, the, the history. And then like, and I have, and I think on that shelf, I've got like 16 Carl Barks, Donald Duck and in, in volumes. And tons of tons of EC comics and a shelf like this of Jack Kirby, like all the all the um, omnibuses. That never sounds like that's the right omnibus. way. To yeah, and never omnibuses doesn't sound like a, a proper plural. I'll go with omnibuy. Yeah, uh, I, I don't I don't know what the answer is to that either, man. I'm just glad they make them. That's as far as I go. Yeah, but yeah. True. Well, ask, ask your ask Max uh, Collins when 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 you do. Is he a Bo Plenty fan? Is he integrating Bo Plenty? I'm due. I'm due to talk to him because he's doing all this um, stuff with uh, Mike Hammer and. Um, uh, oh yeah. Wayne. And uh, yeah, I uh, no, I, I we we talked last year for the first time in several years, and I'm like, dude, we got to talk more. So yeah. no, I am due to talk uh, to him again sooner than later. Uh, yeah, I, I, will, I will ask him about Bo Plenty. That's a great subject, man. I could, I could, I could do without the Bo. Plenty. But there's, there's, let's not dwell on the on the on my least favorite. Aspect of that strip, that that thing is legendary. The villains oh, yeah. are incredible. You can't even believe some of the violence that's that's going on in that strip when they have like I, I forgot the name of the sisters, but they're like they're they get caught without like a hunting license and they take the dude and they kill him and they they stuff his body into like a deer. And they have like some there's and there's another villain who has who gets like frostbite and loses his fingers. Like it's amazing how like actually much more violent. Than a lot of the EC stuff that was banned, like in much more right. extremely violent. There's and it torture and it going on, going on in the strip with like spikes going into people's faces, bullets going through heads, and blood splattering up. Like, oh yeah. And, and and I know, and I know that he was kind of hardlining against all of the, um, like all the seduction of the innocent. That whole trial that he was hardlining against those comics and wanted to differentiate himself from it. I'm like, you can differentiate yourself from those comics, but your stuff is first off hitting like 10,000 times the number of people and is significantly more explicitly violent. It is and, the in, in the new, and in the newspaper, five days, seven days a week. Right. I mean, that's, that's the other thing, man. It wasn't on a newsstand. You know, oh, we're corrupting our children. 
this is in the newspaper. And again, as you know, comic strips were, you know, for a wider audience, was for an adult audience as much as a kid audience. Yeah, no, I'm yeah. with you, man. It's it's fat. Chester Gold is fascinating. Absolutely agree. Zala, this has been great, man. Honestly, I can't thank you enough. Great, great conversation. Organisms from an ancient cosmos out now from Dark Horse, written and drawn by our guest today, as Craig Zoller. Uh, always a pleasure. Please come back when you have something new. I, I, love, I love where the conversation went, man. Thank you. My, 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 my pleasure. I've enjoyed uh, I've enjoyed checking out your episodes since I kind of learned about you after the last cycle. I've, I've, I've certainly watched you and Tom King go pretty deep in some Warner Brothers gangster history and uh, and, and, and enjoyed. So uh, thanks for putting out the content I enjoyed, and thanks for having me on. Well, that means a lot, man. Thank you for the content you put out. And everybody, I'll remind you, uh, early morning word balloon live tomorrow, 10 a.m. Eastern time. Uh, you saw an example of his art, uh, Dave Gibbons, earlier in the conversation. We will be talking about Dave's autobiography, I believe, also from Dark Horse Comics. And uh, that that or, or I got to be sure about that. But regardless, sure where 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 it's where it's being published. It's definitely Dave, regardless. So that's happening <laughs> tomorrow and. Um, Wednesday afternoon, Jeff Lemire, another very individual comic artist, oh, wow. art and story, will be joining us. At, I'm, uh, I'm in some distinguished company. Thanks for having me. Oh, yeah, man. No, it's a good week here on Word Balloon. So enjoy it. Until next time, stay safe, stay happy, stay healthy.